It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Jack Blanc, the third speaker in this distinguished lecture series. Among attorneys in the US or elsewhere who specialize in financial crime, corruption, money laundering, and offshore tax evasion, Jack is so uniquely qualified and experienced that he is really in a class of one. There is no other Blum-like expert to equal or exceed him. He is the man. I was privileged to get to know Jack and to work with him some years ago when I brought him in as an investigator and legal specialist for a client of mine who needed exactly what Jack offered. We hit it off right away and became friends as well as colleagues. On that score, let me say that I want to keep Jack as a friend and never want to have him as a foe. You see, when Jack has you in his crosshairs, there's not enough Maalox in all the world to get you through his scrutiny. The back of your program has some nicely sanitized extracts from Jack's bio. It says that he served as a U.S. Senate staff attorney, where he was involved in numerous well-known investigations, including BCCI and General Noriega. Well, if the truth be told, many local attorneys and local accountants owe Jack a huge debt of gratitude for helping make them millionaires many times over. And yes, on the other side of the ledger, there is, there is a number of accountants who are smarting to this day from being relieved of many millions of dollars in damages for their work on behalf of BCCI. In the late 1980s, Jack was special counsel to the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. During that time, while serving as chief investigator for a subcommittee chaired by Senator John Kerry, he first uncovered wrongdoing by BCCI and others. Yes, that is the same John Kerry who is now the U.S. Secretary of State. Jack disclosed that the first Bush Republican administration had soft-pedaled its criminal inquiry into BCCI despite abundant evidence. Later, Jack made similar charges against Senator Kerry's chief patron, Democratic Senator Pell of Rhode Island, who chaired the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee. A Boston Herald article quoted Jack as calling Senator Pell a clunker who was utterly hostile to the BCCI inquiry, but I understand Jack denied making any such accusation. Clark Clifford, a big dim of his time, who had made significant financial contributions to both Senators Pell and Kerry, was also enmeshed in the BCCI scandal. Although such fearless pursuit of the truth may have cost Jack his job as Senator Kerry's chief investigator and at times may have threatened his life, Jack was not deterred. His actions changed the course of history for BCCI and for many other culprits. I recall that in its heyday, BCCI was a big player on the financial scene here in Cayman. In fact, at one time, they had the most popular and well-attended, exquisite Christmas dinners here. It attracted the who's who of the Cayman Islands from the governor on down. And at one point, BCCI had to hold two separate dinners to accommodate everyone. 
That was but one small glimpse of the powerful banking house that Jack helped bring down. In an interview on Democracy Now! last year, January, Jack was asked about tax-dodging activities allegedly related to U.S. presidential candidate Mitt Romney. Jack said they were set up in the Cayman Islands because there is no tax, no disclosure, and no regulation here. Even though Jack might, have been, might not have been accurate and spot on with his facts, he managed to make headlines and cause quite a stir with his remarks. As you know, it caused Mitt many a mailbox moment. Anyway, as I said, I want to keep Jack as my friend and not have him as my foe. So with that said, it is indeed my honor and pleasure to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Jack Blanc. far too many people here to thank. Uh, the hospitality I've received since arriving on the island has been fabulous. Uh, people have been very kind to me, taken me around, and we've had some wonderful conversations and reunions. And I particularly thank Mr. Merrin for his kind remarks and uh, Benna Cummings for what she's done to take care of me and the many people at University College who've been very kind. What I thought I'd do this evening is talk to you a little bit about Cayman history. Uh, probably many of you weren't born uh, when I first came to this island. My first trip here was in 1973. My first trip here was in 1973 when uh, I came as part of a Senate investigation into the disappearance of Robert Vesco's money. Now many of you may not remember Mr. Vesco, but that was one of the premier financial fraud situations uh, of the generation that preceded all of the current discussion of financial crime. It started with a man named Bernie Kornfeld, who set up a mutual fund that had an office in Switzerland, was incorporated in Panama. Uh, Bernie and his staff lived and worked out of France. And what they did was they took money from people who wanted to hide it from their home governments, carried it out of various countries in suitcases, and told them they were investing it uh, across the world. The problem was that for every dollar they invested, they stole another dollar. But this fund became huge. It became a multi-billion dollar fund. And at the point where people realized it was a Ponzi scheme and that Vesco was a crook, uh, that Kornfeld was a crook, they needed somebody to rescue the fund. Enter Mr. Vesco, who proceeded to take the money out of securities, the money that was left, which was a couple of hundred million, out of listed securities and put, them, put the funds in shell companies. Shell companies, uh, which we all understand, had uh, nominees and uh, were opaque. And the money then disappeared. And what happened to that money? It went into the industrialization of the cocaine business. Uh, Vesco went into partnership with a drug dealer named Carlos Leder, and together they turned cocaine from a mom and pop industry into something that was really more akin to General Motors or a major oil company. Well, I happened to stop here uh, simply because, not because Cayman was really on the map as a center for money laundering but because I'd been to other places and people said, well, there are things happening there and you should go look. And at the time, there was only one serious hotel on the island, and that was the Holiday Inn. Uh, now, it's long gone, and uh, 
replaced by something a lot more luxurious. But I'll never forget the first morning I was here, uh, I went down to the lobby and there was a long line of American lawyers wearing suits and ties, and they're all lined up outside a payphone in the lobby. And they were at the payphone because the internal phone system of the hotel had broken down. So I sat down on a bench near the phone and started listening to what was going on in these conversations. And these guys were all on the phone to various bankers here in Cayman, uh, asking what services they could provide for clients who wanted to hide money from the American Internal Revenue Service, from various uh, creditors. It was just a perfect uh, way to find out what people were doing and what they wanted. Well, I didn't think too much of it at the time, but I was struck by how many lawyers there were and how eager they were. Uh, I then uh, met with a rather naive gentleman who was then the, I think, one of the first managers for Citibank here. And I said, do you take in any American business? And he said, oh, no, no. I refer that across the street to the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Uh, and they're kind enough to refer the Canadians to us. <clears throat> well, I began to understand a little bit more. And uh, it, it was clear to me that this was a place I should learn more about and keep an eye on. I became involved in investigations of corruption. And these included Lockheed Aircraft's bribe payments. Uh, these were huge payments. Millions of dollars were paid to the Prime Minister of Japan to get the Japanese airlines to buy uh, aircraft. Uh, there were millions of dollars in cash, in yen, that were delivered, banker's boxes full of currency delivered to the Prime Minister by a former war criminal. Uh, this scandal, which involved the collapse of six governments uh, and the abdication of the Queen of the Netherlands, her husband had been on the payroll of Lockheed and had used the money to subsidize a second family in Paris uh, with illegitimate children and uh, the, whole, the whole kit. Well, that scandal led to the passage of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States. Uh, but it also led to an understanding that corruption is universal. It's not something limited to small islands in the Caribbean or developing countries or those uh, little people off somewhere in Africa or uh, Latin America, that this is a problem for the entire world and probably a problem for the entire world for all time. It's not a problem that comes and goes. Corruption has been around since the beginning of history and probably will be around till the end of history. The question is, what do we do about it? Well, I tried after I left the Senate in that investigation to make the first effort to figure out what a global solution to the problem might be. And I drafted uh, a treaty at the request of the UN Center on Transnational Corporations, a treaty which for years was referred to as the disaster of 1976, because the UN couldn't do anything with it. At the time, we had the Cold War going on, and we had uh, a UN that was divided into blocks. So the communists wanted capitalism called corruption. The Arab bloc wanted Zionism called corruption. The African bloc wanted colonialism and racism called corruption. And they all wanted that folded into a treaty that was really designed to cover people taking payoffs. And by the time they were finished trying to include all of that, the treaty proposal collapsed of its own weight. Well, I couldn't seem to get away from these problems and issues. And I came back again to the Cayman Islands when we started investigating uh, drug trafficking in Central America. And I met a Caymanian, a man named Lee Rich. 
who I understand is still back on the island. And Mr. Rich, uh, I met in prison. He was then uh, a guest of the United States government for having delivered up a barge which had 420 tons of marijuana in it. And uh, the amount of marijuana was so large that of course he couldn't escape the attention of the police in the North Carolina port that he was towing the barge into. So he had the misfortune of getting caught and getting sentenced. And he began to talk about some of his various experiences uh, in that trade. And uh, most important was the problem of money. It's a fact that when you're buying and selling drugs, it's awkward to pay by check or money order or credit card because there's a high probability you'll get caught. So it's all done in cash. And cash is heavy, dirty, very difficult to handle, hard to count, and even worse, more difficult to protect than anything you would ever put your hands on. Because imagine this, you have a shipment of 420 tons of marijuana, you're going to get paid $100 million in US $20 bills or $100 bills. It's hundreds of pounds of money, thousands of pounds of money. And where do you put it? And how do you protect it? You hire some guys to protect it, they'll shoot you and steal the money. You call the local police and say, gee, I have something valuable in my stash house. Would you mind giving us an extra patrol? Hardly likely. That doesn't work very well either. So he talked about how he stored the currency in picnic coolers in a rented house in a way that nobody could see it through the windows. And then he said there were ways of connecting with uh, couriers, uh, aircraft people who would come in, fly in, and fly the money out and bring it here to Cayman. And there would be these money flights, and they'd come in late at night and people would count the cash at the banks. Uh, there would be station wagons and trucks waiting at the airport to pick up the cash. And he said this went on for quite a while until the U.S. government began to wonder where all this currency was coming from. Because here was an island that at the time had 20 some odd thousand people tops and was returning billions of dollars to the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, as it was repatriated by the banks. And we knew that wasn't coming off t-shirts being sold in Georgetown to people off cruise ships. So the Fed said, sorry fellas, you can't ship us any more currency. He said, then I was told the solution to the problem was to go to Panama and talk to the general. And that was General Noriega. Uh, and General Noriega in turn pointed him to a bank that did business in Panama and was Noriega's personal banker. And they were operating in the Colon Free Trade Zone and they would handle all the currency for it. Well, that bank was BCCI. And of course, that led us into BCCI and to start asking questions about what the bank did. And the more questions we asked, the worse it got. The bank itself was built on a fraud. It had no capital. The capital appeared to be money that came in, but the, another part of the bank lent the money to the people who put the capital in. So it was all invented. The accounting was bizarre. The accounting firms that were involved in it uh, were sued and resued. Uh, and there was a joke that was told, uh, Price Waterhouse was one of the accounting firms that represented or, or worked on BCCI. And there was a joke in London, how do you identify the Price Waterhouse accountant who worked on BCCI? He's the guy with the white cane and the dog. So I gather from this investigation we ruined one of Cayman's best Christmas parties. So you'll have to forgive me for that one. <laughs> right. But uh, then, then uh, some time went by, 
And uh, again, I got involved in another matter, and this time it was as a result of some people from BBC suggesting that I come to Cayman with them and uh, talk to a banker here about how he helps Americans dodge taxes. So what we did was we went to the Cayman Airlines magazine, and there was a full-page ad by a man named John Mathewson and a bank called Guardian Bank. Uh, and all I did was call the number in the airline magazine and say, I'd like an appointment. BBC gave me a briefcase with a camera in it, and I walked into Mr. Mathewson's office and he laid out how to launder money, how to hide it here, how to make sure the police wouldn't find it, and then how to get it back to the U.S. in a way that was untraceable. Well, that aired on both BBC and public broadcasting in the United States, which didn't make me terribly popular here, but uh, suddenly people here woke up and they began to investigate Mr. Mathewson's bank. And that investigation led to the closure and liquidation of the bank and an invitation to Mr. Mathewson to leave town, presto, which he did. But what happened next is something many of you, I'm sure, don't know, which is having been thrown out here, he tried to open a bank in the Bahamas. I found out about it and we talked to people in the bah Bahamas newspapers. They wrote about it, and he got thrown out of the Bahamas. So naturally, the next stop was New Jersey. Uh, there, he went to work for a company that uh, uh, was manufacturing illegal boxes to steal cable television service so that you could wire right in and not bother paying the bill. And of course, it, it was just a matter of time till those guys were rounded up and they were about to go to jail. And they said, wait a minute, we have a guy who we want to give up here and he's the guy who laundered our money, John Mathewson. So now Mathewson is facing a hell of a long time in jail. And he in turn says, I have something you'll really like, which is all the records from my Cayman Bank. Uh, which he turned over, and that led to something like 1,500 criminal prosecutions in the United States. I'm pleased to say it also led to very significant and real changes in the Cayman Bank regulatory system. And uh, it, it took that disclosure to really shock people into understanding how important figuring out bank regulation was but that was a real wake-up call. Uh, later, and, and this is really a very strange kind of thing to say, but I didn't know this university college existed. And my kind of way of looking at places tends to be through the lens of all of this criminal activity, not the good stuff. <laughs> so my next port of call here was a couple of years later when I visited uh, one of the uh, people who had been involved in some of the money laundering in Northward Prison, uh, a man named Jill Bodden, who was the guy who ran an air charter service uh, that went around the United States picking up the drug money and bringing it down to Cayman. And he'd been caught and arrested, and he was fighting extradition, and he fought extradition for a long time. What was really strange to me was that uh, he could have gotten off in the United States if he had not fought extradition and cut a deal with the U.S. authorities saying who it was he was picking the money up from and who he was giving it to. But by the time he finally figured out that that was the best way to do it, it was too late because the statute of limitations had run and there was no way to protect uh, no, nothing he could give up, and no way to get off. So he served quite a long time in jail, but I, I remember his descriptions, and again, it reinforced all of the things I learned uh, from Lee Rich. And then finally, uh, I have been working with the UN again in uh, 19, 
99, 2000, 2001. This time on issues of asset recovery. Around the world, when criminal heads of state, and there have been quite a few of those, have stolen money, they've hidden the money, and then when things have gotten rough, they've left town and gone off to enjoy the money they've taken. And I could give you the whole litany of all of these people, but it's hardly worth it. But names like Ferdinand Marcos of the Philippines. Uh, popular revolution, he's ousted, he'd been a dictator for years. He flies out of uh, Manila and he's got plane loads of uh, uh, both uh, jewelry, Imelda's shoes, uh, and a lot of other things. Uh, but this guy had uh, a huge fortune. And for years, people tried to track the money and get it back, uh, largely unsuccessfully. Uh, similar things had gone on in Nigeria with uh, Sonny Abacha. Abacha stole about $9 billion. The money disappeared. The amount recovered was maybe a billion dollars, and that took three, four, five years of litigation. Uh, and that was with the help of various governments where the money was. And I'm pleased to say it wasn't here in Cayman, it was in Switzerland. Switzerland seems to be a favorite place for this sort of thing. So we began to think about how do you ensure that thieves on a national level don't get to enjoy the fruits of the crime. Because that has to be part of deterrence. You have to send a message to the next guy that if he steals the money, he won't be able to keep it. And that's a very difficult message to get across unless you can show that he can't keep it. And it was in that process, I, I worked with the Nigerian government, indeed, uh, I represented them a couple of years ago trying to uh, help them convict the people who were involved in $200 million worth of bribe payments in the Halliburton matter. Uh, Halliburton, a company chaired at the time by Dick Cheney, uh, had paid a couple of hundred million in bribes to get control of a gas plant, a contract to build a gas plant. And they were convicted in the United States of violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, but uh, nobody in Nigeria was because they never got the information about who was paid in Nigeria, and the U.S. was very quiet about it. And I think the U.S. did not like the idea of the Nigerians actually prosecuting Americans for what they had done in Nigeria, which should, in fact, have happened. We began to look at a much deeper problem, which is the problem of cooperation in criminal law. And this is where I'm going to turn from history to hard law and a look at what the future can and should look like in this area of criminal law. Uh, the way we're organized globally doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense if you think about it. Uh, there are about 190 different sovereign entities that present themselves to the United Nations. A lot of this is a consequence of 1919 and the uh, Treaty of Versailles and Woodrow Wilson who believed that any tribe with a flag deserved a country and sovereign status. But what sovereign status means is that what happens inside that country is that country's business, only that country's business. And that dealings between and among countries have to be done by treaty, agreement, and through the connection of different foreign offices. So for example, when we developed evidence in the Lockheed bribe case about the Prime Minister of Japan taking bribes, we literally had the documents. Believe it or not, the jerk signed receipts. <laughs> no. And the Japanese, the prosecutors in Japan, were very anxious to get copies of the receipts, as you can imagine. But there was no machinery for the U.S. to give that information to the Japanese uh, in a way that would make it admissible in a court in Japan. 
And that led to the signing of the very first Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. And I can tell you, if you think back, 1976 is not that long ago. And it has taken many years since to get more of those treaties in place. But those treaties don't work either, because if you're doing a big, complicated investigation of financial crime, you have to get lots of information. And when you get an initial batch of information, it leads to more questions, and you have to make more requests. And the way the system currently works, and I used this example uh, in some conversations earlier today, you have to go through a series of steps to get the information that are very time consuming and frequently don't work. So for example, a uh, friend of mine was robbed, his house was robbed. And the suspect was a Kenyan national who was living in a house behind his house. And there were fingerprints that the detectives came up with. And the, the police wanted to get fingerprints from the Kenyan to find out whether he was the guy. Either exclude him or figure out that he had done it. So what did the police in Bethesda, Maryland have to do? They had to go to their uh, senior people uh, at the state level, who then went to the federal level, who then went from the Justice Department to the State Department to the Kenyan Foreign Office to the Kenyan Justice Ministry to the Kenyan local police. And then when the Kenyan police found the guy, they then had to get the fingerprints and send it back. This time to the Kenyan Justice Ministry, to the Foreign Ministry, to me, and so on. Now, there's a basic rule of bureaucracy. Every time you have to move paper from one desk to another, it takes about a month. <laughs> and if you have to move it from one agency to another, God knows how long it'll take. This does not make for an efficient or well-run investigation of financial crime. Uh, it really makes investigation brutally difficult. And we have to come around and find a way around that. Because it's in part one of the reasons why no one in this huge financial mess that we've seen uh, has really been prosecuted. It's too difficult to get your hands on the evidence. The evidence is in too many different places. And, and here's another one which will surprise you, but there's no way to compel testimony across international borders. I, if I'm a prosecutor in the United States, and I need to have a witness from, let's say, Brazil, there's no way on earth I can force him to come to the United States to testify, even though he's pivotal to my case. This stuff is really simple, but it's got to be made to work. Because we can't run a global financial system without a level of police cooperation and regulatory cooperation that makes the system clean and protects against crime and fraud. Now, when I say makes the system clean, what I mean is that there is enough deterrence to scare the devil out of the 40% of the population that would go criminal if they figured they wouldn't get caught. And to my mind, the real tragedy of this financial crisis has been the failure to hold individuals responsible to send a message to a lot of other individuals that crime doesn't pay. Because so far, the message has been crime pays. And that's not a message that any society uh, hoping to be decent and hoping to be free of crime can accept. We have to send a message through this kind of prosecution. So, I, I propose that there be a lot of thought given to how we're going to get around the issue of sovereignty and how we're going to make it possible for investigations to work, really work, across national boundaries. Because merely having arrangements for exchanging information 
doesn't mean that it will be exchanged, but it will be exchanged in timely fashion, that there'll be appropriate follow-up. And those things are all absolutely pivotal to protecting the integrated financial system we're all living with. We need to have research on the subject, and we need to explore some new ideas. And those new ideas include things like this. Uh, I think where legal systems are similar, police and prosecutors should be able to work across international boundaries. I don't see any reason why a qualified lawyer from Cayman, let's say, who's a, a crown counsel in prosecuting mode, shouldn't be able to go to a U.S. court and ask for a search warrant, and then ask to have that executed by U.S. authorities but make that presentation because he's from a similar legal system and he'd meet all of the standards by going to court in the U.S. Currently, that's an impossibility. People laugh out loud if I talk about it. The concept really comes from uh, an idea pioneered by NATO. The military was pretty clever about this. They call it interoperability. You uh, make people functional uh, without dependence on geography. And that interoperability, I think, might be the beginning of a way, particularly in countries with similar backgrounds, similar legal systems, to begin to chip away at some of these problems. But we have to start somewhere, and there has to be a conversation about this. Because without it, we're not going to get anywhere. I, I would leave you with this thought. This island is threatened by something uh, that you all understand, it's global warming. I don't know what the highest uh, point in the, in the Caymans is, above sea level, but it can't be much. <laughs> you are living on a, a sandbar and the ocean is rising. Now. I've heard people here with wonderful ideas about how to cut energy consumption here in Cayman. But what's perfectly clear is you could cut energy consumption in Cayman to zero and the ocean would continue to rise. You have to get everybody else to begin to worry about the problem and do something about the problem to protect yourselves. And it's kind of the inverse of the problem of regulation and prosecution. That is, there are going to be these global problems, like a global financial system that has to be protected, that have to be dealt with together. We have to find a way to work together, find a way to get around international boundaries, and get serious about it. And I just invite you to think about these problems and try to figure out how we carry it to the next step and do it in a way that respects everybody's rights and uh, respects the rule of law, but also protects us from predatory behavior uh, by people who really have no business being in the world of finance or being, for that matter, in any business capacity. So with that, I thank you very much, and thank you again for the hospitality you've shown, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, we've got, we've got two microphones roaming around the, uh, the hall. And uh, Mr. Bloom is happy to take a few questions. Mr. Bloom, I do appreciate your presentation tonight. And the question that I have deals with the internet. Do you believe that with so many people having so much input into the internet, is it making it harder or easier for people to get away with financial misconduct? Well, that's, it's both. It's harder and easier. Uh, what, what has made it somewhat harder is many more people can check things out very quickly. So when a guy showed up at my door 
uh, saying he worked for a particular company and they were working on driveways and he was going to fix my driveway for very little money, I could get on the web and find out he'd been convicted for fraud in several cases and he was out scamming again. So in that sense, it's very helpful. Uh, on the other hand, the ability to communicate instantly and move money even more quickly uh, makes the trail very difficult to follow and uh, it underscores the need for international cooperation and investigation because this money moves without any concern about sovereignty, borders, or anything else. It's like, uh, we'll, we'll put it wherever. It was a wonderful case, which I should talk to you about, which is on point. In the late 1970s, most major banks had not yet fully computerized their international operations. And a very enterprising bank branch manager in Brussels, working for Citibank, was trading currencies in ways that violated Belgian law for currency trading. And when the Belgian police raided the Citibank office, he said, no, 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 these trades were booked in the Bahamas. Uh, the Belgian police said, but wait a minute, you're mailing copies of the trades two weeks later, and they don't get to the Bahamas for another two weeks. So what's this nonsense about booked in the Bahamas? Well, within a matter of six months, Citibank had the computers in place, and indeed, they were booked in the Bahamas instantly. So now, what had been a way of controlling disappeared. So it's the good and the bad. about money laundering procedure? Well, I'm saying that you don't have to Yes. Cayman, Cayman has been doing, uh, Cayman has been doing a lot uh, and has come a very long way in uh, cracking down on money laundering and the misuse of Cayman institutions. Uh, the problem is now much more related to how the different pieces fit together. So how does a fiduciary company that provides corporate services here fit into a larger scheme created that involves six or eight or ten jurisdictions? And who takes responsibility for the end result of a scheme like that? And where is the responsibility for regulating, investigating, or prosecuting? So uh, we, we really do have uh, complicated problems remaining to be resolved. Well, there's to add. You mentioned the story of Mr. Patterson. Yes. What do you think the extent of corruption, as in inter island corruption, one person going from island to island, is? Yeah. The Caribbean has some unique problems of corruption. And there are, there are many islands that have been infected by very serious corruption. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Antigua, uh, where the Stanford uh, operation uh, paid off the prime minister, did whatever it wanted, and Stanford stole the money. And I think the great mistake he made, he was laundering drug money for the Mexican cartels, and his mistake was he spent it. And now I think he likes life in prison because if he's ever out, he'll be shot on sight by the Mexicans. Uh, but Antigua has been left with wreckage because of it. They're paying the bill. 
Uh, there are other islands that have suffered uh, equally badly from corruption and corrupt financial service officials. Uh, Jamaica has had its uh, difficulties. I could go on, but these are problems which have to be resolved. And at least in the Eastern Caribbean, it is understood that you have to have judges who come to the islands from other islands because you can't get an impartial judiciary in an island that has 50,000 people where everybody knows everybody else and they're all related. Uh, that, that makes it very difficult to take down somebody who's corrupt. And here you have the advantage of uh, the fact that there are various officials appointed by the governor and the ability to go after the kind of corruption that other islands find very difficult to do simply because their justice ministries uh, are all interwoven with the fabric of the island they're on. Yeah, I fully agree with you about the problems of international investigations. We get over it normally because as investigators there's normally uh, we will find a way to go through the difficulties of international legislation. But I'm going back to what you spoke about, was that on many of the cases you described, you used the phrase that we were able to cut a deal and give somebody a further up. Right. Could you have operated under the English common law system where to offer the deal negates its use in evidence? That is a problem, and that's a problem also in continental Europe. Uh, the favorite tool of American prosecutors is, look, you're going to face the rest of your life in jail, or you're going to come up with the material we need to go up the chain and figure out who done it. Uh, the answer is I'm not sure. And uh, I'm not sure that our system doesn't get abused as well. So this is, this is an issue that one really has to look at carefully. I don't pretend to say that I have a flat answer that I can give you, yes or no, or right or wrong. I have a question, not least because there's a joint total thing. Yeah. You asked the question, is it time now that the English common law system reviewed the way it was putting a deal? Yeah. Let's be honest. I, I... Are you in terms of wanting to bear his soul, clear his heart? Uh, in terms of God, shall I say, uh, unless somebody offers him a better choice for that future. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's something I think we should be considering and looking at, but I also think it's important to be certain that whatever the guy tells you, as he's bearing his soul, is the truth. Because there are plenty of people who bared their souls and lied their hearts out. Uh, in an effort to get off, and they try to take other people down and leave themselves in the clear. So this really requires both law enforcement sophistication and uh, a real judicial search for the truth. And Good evening. Uh, we have discussed the investigation of corruption. Uh, so what was your very first um, corruption investigation case that you ever worked on? The, the most serious and uh, really the first were these uh, international bribe payments by major corporations. Uh, I had worked on a lot of financial crime stuff earlier, uh, most of it involving things like, believe it or not, mortgage fraud. I did an investigation of securitized mortgage fraud. Are you ready for this? In 1969. But it was uh, the Lockheed case and the most astonishing collection of documents about how they just systematically paid people off or hired agents who were going to do the payoff. Uh, and that, that was a shocker because you expected there would be payoffs for small things. So for example, in Latin America you would say, well, I expect to pay a bribe coming through immigration or customs. Uh, or in Mexico, You'd say, well, I'm driving down the road and there's a policeman, he's going to stop me and I expect to have to pay him something to go on my way. But this was really large-scale stuff by very high-ranking people. And that was the, the shocker. Now, I will tell you about uh, an experience uh, I had talking about corruption. 
in Jalisco State in Mexico, which is arguably one of the most corrupt states in Mexico, which is not exactly a country known for integrity. And uh, the conversation went something like this. If you take someone who's 18, 19 years old, you give them a uniform, a badge, and a gun, you give them a motorcycle, and you pay them about 20% of what it costs to live, what have you just created? A corrupt cop. So I, I said this to an audience of government people in Jalisco, and they all look at me and they're nodding, yes, yes, yes. So I said, the answer is you've got to pay them more. And all of a sudden they froze. <laughs> you know, pay them more? How are we going to do that? And the answer is collect tax. And now they really froze <laughs> because collecting tax is at the heart of being able to fund the government that isn't inherently corrupt because if people are so badly paid, it's the only way to get by. So uh, this subject of taxation becomes key to the question of corruption. And that link is something you should keep in mind when people talk about, well, taxes are a curse and all the rest of it. Government has to be paid for. And when you don't, you pay another way. Good evening. My question is, you said that criminals should not be allowed to keep their ill their ill gotten gain well, right? So what do you suggest be done with the money that has been confiscated? Well uh, it seems to me to be obvious that the, if the money was stolen, let's say, from a government, like a bacha, that it go back to the government it was stolen from. And maybe it goes back in, in the form of a contribution to uh, some civil society group for a humanitarian purpose, to an educational institution. I'd be delighted if some monies that were recovered here in Cayman from people who had done bad things funded this university college. That'd be a great idea. Good afternoon. I have a question. Do you believe money laundering is still prevalent in the Cayman Islands? And do you believe that and do you believe that it's being encouraged by external sources? At the moment, I'd say uh, Cayman is a really lousy place to launder money. The action has moved uh, to places like Guatemala and Panama, uh, and there the rules are much looser. And the, the problem in Panama is really acute because the Panamanians have done the dumbest imaginable thing, which is they've taken U.S. currency as their own currency. So it's perfectly legal to show up in Panama with a suitcase of currency and put it in a bank because all you're doing is depositing, I believe they call U.S. dollars Balboas once they cross the border of Panama. But that, that seems to me to be a horrible mistake. And it's a mistake for a second reason. Every note printed by a central bank is really an obligation, it's a debt. So it's evidence of a debt. So what the Panamanians have done is lend the United States, interest-free, all of the money in circulation in Panama. And the last thing the average Panamanian needs is to lend America interest-free money. Um, so, um, really, to be a moment of information on trade with each other, but why one story, how do you expect countries to trade information with one another when it could be the demise of the infrastructure because of such corruption building and providing one another? It would fall apart half if it wasn't for that corruption. Yeah, well, it, it, it's not without difficulty. And uh, the problems that I've seen are well, how do you deal with a government you think is corrupt when they're seeking the information? I think you have to figure out who you can deal with and do the best you can. You have to give governments the opportunity to go after the bad people, even if those governments are governments you don't completely trust to do the job very well. Because if you don't help them, 
nobody will do anything, and the situation will only get worse. Presentation. My question is, with your very knowledge and you have a lot of experience, um, what has been the most interesting case that you've worked on that strikes you as, you know, it is that close? Well, I, I don't think there's any one that I can say was most interesting. I can tell you that uh, in my line of work, there's very little boredom. Uh, things are always interesting. They're always complicated. And uh, my poor wife, I now, uh, whenever I get some new matter, it typically starts with some other lawyer or investigator shipping me about six or seven large cartons of documents, which he wants me to read immediately, if not sooner. And my wife is looking at the boxes and saying, oh God, more paper, where do we put it? <laughs> There are uh, funds that this goes into, and the funds are divided among the governments that uh, actually participate in the seizure of the money. So there are international agreements on the division of funds, and uh, the country the money came from and the people who seized it all get a piece of the action. Now, there's a, there's a risk here, and it's complicated, because uh, when you simply reward people for seizing things, they go out and seize them. And we've had some really bad stories of police departments in the United States seizing property, claiming they were involved in crime, proceeds of crime, when all the cops were doing was trying to steal, essentially, property from innocent citizens. That has to be done very carefully and with proper judicial protection. Um, my question is, do you think Cayman is better off than money laundering, seeing that in Britain than it's going to happen, or what could it go Cayman is now better off, uh, certainly, than it was, and better off than most places. And certainly, as far as cash goes, I'd say this is not a good place to come with a suitcase full of cash. You will be caught, and the money will be confiscated. Uh, there are a lot of other places where that won't happen, but uh, Cayman has uh, done a good job on that front. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. I think that the systems for plain old-fashioned launder the cash are pretty good. We don't need to do more. If anything, it's just simply a question of budget, resources, and uh, the ability to spend the time necessary to enforce the law. But I think the more important questions now are what has to be done to prevent and recover funds like funds that go walk about when a hedge fund manager takes the money and now the trail of the money leads to six or seven or eight different jurisdictions and people come here and file suit and they're trying to figure out where did the money go and uh, it will cost uh, many millions to follow that trail if you can follow that trail and that's what I'm focused on and that's where things get really difficult. So for example, I have seen agreements that set up some of these funds and there are lawyers involved, there's a service company involved, there are accountants involved. All of these people write contracts with a guy who wants to set up the fund and the agreements all have in them paragraphs that say I'm not responsible. Right? You can't hold me responsible for what those other guys do, and they're all not responsible. Now the liquidator comes, and who do I go after? Because all of them are now contractually free of responsibility for the fact that the money went walkabout. So now you've got to find the guy who ran the fund and maybe try to trace the money. But this is going to be one brutally difficult proposition.
And there has to be some change in that and some level of accountability by fiduciaries. <laughs> What can an individual do to protect against in, an individual do to protect against political corruption? Well, individually, it's hard, but uh, there are lots of ways you can uh, get at corruption. One of them is insist on public records, insist that government documents be public, insist that there be an archive, a national archive, and records so that when there's a government contract let, you can go back and take a look at the vouchers and the contract and compare it to the performance. Uh, there are many different things you can do. And you can also do something positive, which is honor people who display integrity. So if people step forward and they see something, and they really take it to the police, they should be respected in the society. And it's sometimes risky, sometimes not popular, but it's something that is part of your duty as a citizen to do. Uh, if you see somebody stealing and you don't report it, what you're doing is allowing uh, the system to fail. Online, there is a large problem about the state involved in activities. Do you think that what are your suggestions to help deal with this issue? I think you've uh, got the solution at hand, which is here, people have been caught, uh, people are being tried, and the legal system is doing its job. And that is the solution. What, what prosecution is all about, as I said, and I'll give you a, a kind of two-minute course in criminology. Uh, maybe save you taking another course uh, later or <laughs> changing the curriculum here. But it goes something like this. Uh, a professor of mine who was uh, head of the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge University uh, said that the way the world works is about 50 to 60 percent of people are just plain honest. They were altar boys at the church. They were uh, raised in families where if you did something wrong, your father would really take, take the wood to you. Uh, and they won't think about doing anything wrong. I had an FBI agent friend who said he grew up thinking that if he stole an apple from a corner store, God would reach down and whack him, right then and there. <laughs> so these people are not a societal problem. The problem comes with the next 40%. And these are a whole bunch of sort of crafty folks, and they're looking around. Where are the cops? No cops? Okay, I'll do what I want to do. No chance of getting caught? For sure I'll do what I want to do. And uh, those are the people who you have to scare straight. You have to make them really believe there's a chance they're going to get caught. And the way you do that is, there's about 5% of the society and they're sociopaths, and they don't care. They don't care about anything. They don't care about police. They'll just plain commit crime. So you prosecute the hell out of them to scare the hell out of the 40% who would do it if nobody was prosecuted. That's roughly the way the system works. But you have to have those prosecutions, and you have to be able to make people respect the law. Then, I think I have to ask the last question. My question is, with Cayman being a high-income society, do you think, in your opinion, that has anything to do with our history of um, money laundering? Well, I think that one thing that makes Cayman very different is the number of uh, expatriates who uh, have set up shop here. And uh, what you're raising, uh, and I'm not, I'm not here talking about money laundering as the source of wealth, what you're really raising is inherently uh, what kind of economy would the islands of the Caribbean have if they didn't have financial service businesses? 
And uh, that is a very serious problem. Cayman has done it successfully, but if we look at the rest of the Caribbean, uh, the places that have tried it have wound up with catastrophes and uh, problems, and many of the islands of the Caribbean have no way to make a living. And this is another issue that I've thought a lot about because I've spent time all over the Caribbean. Uh, we in the United States have taken an insane posture toward the entire region. And when I say insane, it's we blocked free movement of people. We have very tough immigration laws and standards and they get worse, not better, when there are so many people who are one way or another leaving the islands to find better jobs, let's say in the United States, and they're being forced to do it illegally under the table in ways that don't work. When what should be happening is we should recognize we're part of one big regional family and that that opportunity should be there for anyone who wants to, to go to a place where work is available. And many of these islands could then live on remittances from the people who are actually earning money in a place where you can do it. Uh, I realize that uh, this is too, uh, is a complicated problem very complicated problem, but I think that we're going to come to a point where we'll see that a solution to that problem will come, and that, that's because the character of the American population is changing radically. Uh, we now are really a nation of many peoples, of all different colors, uh, origins, ethnicities, and uh, this idea that you keep everybody out who's other is an idea who, that can't last very much longer. So thank you all again. It's been a pleasure to be here. OK, I'm going to ask Jack to remain on stage, and I'm going to invite Dr. Alan Young come and say a few words of thanks for us. Dr. Young. Mr. Bloom, on behalf of the president, the faculty and staff, the organizing committee, and our distinguished lady who patronized this event, I just want to give you this gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am aware of what Dr. Smith said. He said that this place should be a center of intellectual thought. And I believe that, and I hope that one of these days, the University College of the Cayman Islands will be a beacon just like that of intellectual thought. I want to just offer this that Martin Luther King said, stated that the most dangerous criminal maybe the man with gifted reason, but with no morals. And it is so appropriate that you have, uh, during all of what you have said tonight and last night when we met together, you are pointing out that individuals need to have some element of moral morality in order to be able to make these islands a better place. And you said that there should be a path forward and the, the whole issue of sovereignty. We must start somewhere. We must do something. Find ways to respect, honor people with integrity. And um, I just want to say thanks to Ms. Bernard Thompson Cummins, the pat patron for the Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you for your continued support, madam. And Jack, again, I want to say thank you for uh, 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 a lecture that was well received tonight. And for all our sponsors, whether in cash or kind, I just want to say thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this lecture series would not be, um, would not be as successful as it has been if you did not attend. And tonight, we just want to thank you. And students, I'm glad that you were able to ask questions. I want to thank you all. 
and hopefully at some point in time, we will just talk to, to Jack a little bit later. Thank you very much.